Well, I've got 11.01, so why don't we go ahead and get started with everybody's game? Yep. All right, good. Well, welcome back, everybody, uh, and welcome to those of you joining us for the first time as well uh, to another TeachingAmericanHistory.org Saturday webinar sponsored, as always, by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University, TeachingAmericanHistory.org, or TAH.org for short, is the leading online resource for documents-based study of American history, government, and civics, with a lot of resources for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I uh, teach po uh, political science and history here at uh, Ashland University. And um, the theme of this year's webinar series, as you know, is moments of crisis. And for those who might be joining us for the first time, let me just point out that our purpose is to talk about an interesting moment in uh, U.S. history with some thoughtful scholars and have a have a, a friendly but scholarly conversation for an hour or so uh, about this particular topic. And as always, we invite you joining us to participate in that conversation by submitting questions. So please put your questions in the chat box and uh, I'll get to as many as possible. And of course, our our scholars joining us today are also welcome to address any of the questions. I see them coming in already. That's great. Um, but feel free to address those questions at any point if you like. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link by which you can request a certificate of participation, and that email will also include a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today we're talking about the sinking of the USS Maine in 1898, and I'm very happy to have with us uh, two very thoughtful scholars. Um, Jennifer Keene of Chapman University is here, and uh, Jennifer also teaches in our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Um, and Jason Stevens of Ashland University, who also teaches in our MAG program, as it's called uh, for short. Uh, just mentioned quickly, Jennifer has published several outstanding books and articles, um, especially on World War I, uh, but, but even beyond World War I, um, really fantastic books uh, that I highly recommend. And, and Jason, your dissertation I know included an analysis of McKinley's foreign policy. So I thought maybe this would provide some interesting insights uh, from your perspective uh, on the Spanish-American War, and in particular, the sinking of the Maine in 1898. So again, thank you both for being here. Um, I, I guess I hope I, at some point, I know we're going to discuss the sort of um, causes of the Spanish-American War in general. I'd like to talk about sort of the causes that lead up to it. How do we end up in this splendid little war, as of course it was called? Um, how do we end up in the war? What leads up to it? And of course, I'd also like to, to hear your thoughts on sort of the consequences in the aftermath of the war and how that affects uh, the United States both at home and say in the future, especially future conflicts including World War I, what effect do our experiences during the Spanish-American War have on um, America, let's say, uh, leading up to and getting into World War I? But um, since our theme is specifically the sinking of the Maine, I guess I'm just gonna start, let's just start with the, what are probably the two most common questions about the Maine, and I'd love to hear either of your thoughts on this. Uh, one, uh, what, what was the real effect that the sinking of the Maine had uh, on getting America involved in the war? Uh, was that the singular event that, that actually led to our official involvement? Is that what led Congress to declare war? Uh, of course, one of the few times Congress actually declares war. Uh, that's one of the big, probably most common questions. And I suspect the other one, of course, is, well, why did the Maine actually blow up, right? Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy over those two things. So, um, Jennifer, would you care to share your thoughts on either of those two, two things? Or uh, I should point out at the beginning here, of course, and Jason knows this already, you are perfectly free to ignore me and any of my questions and talk about <laughs> more interesting things. <laughs> so. uh, sure, I, I'm, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a very good morning for me since I'm talking to you from California. So it's, it's eight o'clock in the morning for me over here. Um, this is a, a really interesting question, always really in a sense regarding any war, which is at what moment does the final decision get made? And I, I do think that in any war, and especially in this war, it's important to uh, separate out the sort of underlying, um, uh, uh, when I say conversations or concerns about what's going on in Cuba, 
with the actual moment that a decision is made. And I think we should be careful never to presume inevitability in really any war, that at a certain point, a decision is made. And so in that sense, I think this is why the main is so important, because the main is the moment when the decision is made to go to war. And it, it didn't have to go that way. It's an interesting parallel between the war I study more, more significantly, World War One, and the main to realize that the main uh, explodes in February, but the the actual declaration of war does not happen until several months later. And the exact same thing happens in World War One when the Germans resume unrestricted submarine warfare in January and the decision for war doesn't come until April. So I think one of the things if we want to feel um, better about decisions for war is to realize that this is the result of several months of deliberation and argument. It's not, it's not like Pearl Harbor where immediately it's clear, you know, right away we're going to war. So in that sense, even though all of these examples I'm giving involve ships, <laughs> we should <laughs> we should realize that there's some important differences. So in a nutshell, that's where I would kind of place the significance of, of the main as one as the catalyst that provokes the decision to to start this war. Yeah, that, that's very well stated. So it's it's it, we have to be cautious in linking any particular event. If I understand what you're getting at, <clears throat> uh, we want to be a little cautious in saying it's a, it's any single particular event in the case of, of the Spanish American War that ultimately leads. It's a factor, of course, right? And perhaps. Well, I think factor. that it's it 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 it's the moment at which it seems that a decision has to be made. That ah. that the the way that McKinley, well, I'm not an expert in McKinley foreign policy. Now you intimidated me by introducing Jason the way you did. <laughs> so, so Jason, feel free to correct me here. But it, from my understanding of it, it seems that the uh, McKinley is trying to use diplomacy and the moment at which he loses the backing of Congress to continue along that diplomatic path happens as a result of the main being, being a main exploding. That's great. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right and, and very, very well stated, uh, Jennifer, that the, the sinking of the main um, is, I think you called it the catalyst for, um, for a, a decision on war. Uh, and I think that I think that aptly uh, describes uh, the situation as it existed in the United States in February 15, 1898, when the main um, is sunk. And as you, you correctly point out, right, there's several months that go by between the sinking of the main and uh, a declaration of war or McKinley's request for a declaration of war uh, to Congress. And in between that, those two, those two events, um, what's going on in the United States um, is, is um, worth our consideration because it's the, the sinking of the main immediately sort of spurs on the um, those in the country, uh, mostly among the, the Republican Party, uh, who were already in favor of war with Spain, um, who were pushing McKinley in that direction. Uh, up until the, uh, the sinking of the main, McKinley tries to remain a, um, a sort of the, the ballast between the two extremes, the, the pro and the anti-war factions in the country. Uh, but once the main is sunk and we immediately sort of jump to the conclusion uh, and the circumstances of the time pointed us in the direction that it was sunk deliberately by the Spanish in Havana Harbor in Cuba. And the newspapers immediately jump on this. So William Randolph Hearst, Pulitzer, Yellow Journalism, jump on the um, the sinking of the the main as sort of the the final straw when it comes to future negotiations with with Spain. It's at that moment that um, many in the country say these negotiations are over. The only honorable path forward is war. So you have um, right the the slogan um, "Remember the main to hell with Spain." becomes the the mantra uh, especially of the the pro-war 
uh, faction in the country um, that basically removes further deliberation or negotiation with Spain, takes that option off the table once and for all, I think. Yeah. yeah so, and I, oh, sorry, can I? No, please I was, go ahead. Jim. I was just going to say, I like, I think that that formulation of suddenly turning what had been in many respects, a concern about a humanitarian crisis in Cuba, the way that Spain had been attempting to suppress the rebellion and the notion that America had almost a responsibility to stop these atro atrocities. When you, when you combine that with Jason, what you're saying now an assault to national honor. And this is a sense that not only are we maybe shirking our duty as a rising world power by not intervening to stop suffering, but now we're sort of being slapped in the face and we're going to be considered a third rate power if we don't actually stand up um, to this to this insult, that that's a powerful combination that McKinley finds harder and harder to resist as this as this conversation goes on in the aftermath of the Maine. Yeah, and I think that I think that's exactly right. And uh, Chris, I know you've written on this topic as well. And <laughs> what Jennifer has just observed here, right, that it's a combination, this wicked combination of, on the one hand, um, preserving national honor, preserving the national interest, um, avenging the loss of American life at the hands, mm -hmm. supposedly, at the hands of the Spanish in Havana Harbor. Um, you combine that with, as Jennifer pointed out, the humanitarian crisis that's going on in Cuba. Um, McKinley, in asking for his declaration of war, combines those two things as justification. We're going to war, one, on behalf of American interests, because it's in America's, it's in the essential national self-interest of the country to go to war, but also in order to help other foreign oppressed peoples. That's a combination that we see for the first time in the Spanish-American War, or what I ought to say, the first time as justification for America to go to war. That had never happened before in the nation's history. That had never happened before. What I mean is um, the justification for war had never been for the sake of uplifting or helping other foreign oppressed peoples. It had always been focused solely on American interests, on preserving American rights and liberties here now for the first time. And as a result of the, largely as a result of the sinking of the Maine, you have a, an American president justifying to Congress that we need to go to war. Yeah, it's about ourselves. We're, we're going to, you know, look out our own interests and we need to protect our interests and our honor, but also we need to help those poor suffering Cubans who are being mistreated by their Spanish overlords. And that's where the emphasis is. And that had never happened before in American foreign policy history. It's worth noting. It, definitely. And I think you can see exactly that same very powerful combination when you when you look at World War One, and you, you can, when you start thinking about this as a transitional moment in terms of that kind of new way that America is going to go to war in the 20th century, I think that that combination is something that we see uh, reverberating throughout future conflicts uh, that the United States becomes engaged in. And I would just also add to that that this is part of an internal debate within the United States in which we also see a little bit of distrust on the part of people who are primarily motivated by the humanitarian independence element when we consider the Teller Amendment being added to the war resolution. So yes. that, so that it, a there's a point. sense that, um, yes, we say this, do we mean it? And there's skeptics even within the country. And so that, that, that ongoing debate about you send the dual message and then maybe one half doesn't feel you've totally lived up to the bargain. And that's, I think, another dynamic we see developing mm -hmm. out of this conflict. Yeah, uh, Jeff, I, these are all great points. Um, these are really, by the way, just let me say that both of your comments or all of your comments are really helping to frame why we should consider this a, a moment of crisis or as, you, as you're nicely putting it, a, a moment of decision. Um, but that the, the point about the Teller Amendment introduces that other sort of underlying um, element of our democratic republic, which means in a way the, the, the opinions of the people matter <laughs> in, in such decisions, right? And the Teller Amendment, uh, just so everybody knows, if I remember correctly, the Teller Amendment was meant to, uh, once, once, the, uh, once Congress had authorized intervention in Cuba, it was meant to 
place uh, limits on the uh, on the extent to which, if I'm not putting this right, correct me, on the extent to which Cuba could become sort of permanently under the governance of the United States. So the Teller Amendment was really meant to preserve, ultimately, I believe, right, the uh, Cuban independence in the aftermath yeah, yeah. of the war, yeah, and, that's right. and yeah. keep it out from under uh, the the grasp of the United States. Yes, and, exactly. And that, that reflects real concerns. This larger debate that you that you both have brought up among Americans about the pros and cons of of, of a kind of imperialism, right? And I think this goes this feeds into the the documents that we had for today's session, which is that there is a sense of a of, of well, you see the debate playing out with why aren't we doing the same thing with the Philippines? So if we had these mixed motivations when it came to um, liberating Cuba or, or, or declaring war on Spain to liberate Cuba, um, when the Philippines kind of now enter in, and it's worth noting that, you know, the first military action of the war is is in the Philippines. It's, yeah. not, it's not in Cuba. So... So this is where people start crying foul, saying, wait a minute, you know, this is kind of smoke and mirrors here. You've right. got us looking at the main, <laughs> but right. like Dewey goes into Manila Harbor. Where are the Philippines? You know, <laughs> so never heard of them. Never heard of them. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> and you see that playing out in the in the in the documents here, the sense that, well, why didn't we adopt the same kind of attitude towards um, liberating the Philippines from Spanish oppression? Yeah. So that so right away that those those that newness of this message provokes debate within the country yeah so with the teller amendment in cuba the decision is made right away that america in entering this war on behalf of the cuban people america has no selfish ends of its own to serve right the teller amendment we are going to um preserve cuban independence moving forward america is not going to be interested in subjugating the the cuban people um to you know kick the spanish out and then replace the iron yoke of spanish rule with a less oppressive or golden american yoke we are going to preserve these people's independence but in terms of the philippines there's no decision that's made up front early on in the progress of the war about okay how exactly are we going to handle the philippines you don't have an equivalent of the teller amendment in the philippines um, and I think for McKinley, in the early on in the war, he's not sure what he's going to do with the Philippines. And it, it's not until towards the end of the conflict and when it comes to, okay, are we going to incorporate these people into the United States? Are they going to become a territory for future statehood? Um, will they be a colony? Will we grant them full and equal independence like in regards to the Cubans? McKinley doesn't make that decision until very late he had for most of the conflict sort of waffled back and forth regarding okay what are we going to do with the philippines i for most of the the period mckinley seemed to be um focused intently on the island of luzon so the sort of the prize jewel of the philippines his initial thoughts are you know what maybe right all we need is luzon and we can use that as a military outpost and it can be useful for advancing american interests in the pacific right. um but eventually, as time wears on, and especially after um, what McKinley described as one prayerful night, where he spends the evening in contemplation and, and in silent <laughs> prayer regarding what should, we, should America do with the Philippines, he eventually decides almost entirely, I would say entirely, on his own to annex the entire archipelago. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, a remarkable thing, too, when you consider that the the Philippines, the people living in what we call the Philippines, didn't necessarily identify themselves as as Filipinos. That's a, if I remember correctly, that's a relatively recently sort of created category of people who happen to be living on these, you know, you know, hundreds of islands in, in this archipelago. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but that does play a factor in this decision because, as you point out, Jason. There were quite a few people arguing, we don't need to take the whole Philippines because there's there's really, I mean that's sort of a um, uh, what do we call a sort of a invented description of this place. It's really Luzon and and the other various islands that we mm -hmm. need to be thinking about. And therefore, if we think about it in that way, what we need to do is consider um, which of those islands are necessary, as you put it, for for promoting American interests, either. 
as uh, as um, ways of expanding American commercialism into Southeast mm -hmm. Asia mm -hmm. and into the Pacific, or as potential military um, and naval bases <clears throat> that would allow us to sort of keep an eye on what the Europeans are doing. It's just, mm -hmm. That's the other kind of underlying, another underlying factor here, uh, I think, is that <clears throat> this debate over sort of expanding into the Philippines and other places is taking place in the context of pretty rapid European expansionism and colonization of various places, including Southeast Asia. Yeah, and that, that goes back to what we were all talking about before regarding um, why America is getting involved in this war in the first place. If it was purely for preserving American self-interest, just annexing Luzon for its, its uh, commercial and military uh, benefits to the United States, that would sort of go along with, um, with uh, the, the mindset of American foreign policy up until the Spanish-American War. But when you start combining self-interest with um, acting on the behalf of foreign and oppressed peoples, that no longer becomes enough. And it's not, an, it, it's not enough for McKinley, who feels a moral obligation to these, these Filipinos, this invented term, mm -hmm. as you rightly point out, Chris, uh, to uplift them spiritually and materially, to, to, to help them out, to advance them along the, um, the, the, the trials and tribulations of self-government. And McKinley says, look, we have an obligation to these people. We have to help them out. And the only way we can help them out is by annexing the whole thing. Yeah. And I would, I would just add that I think that then, of course, as the Filipinos, well, I'll just use that term, um, protest and begin fighting that this earlier element we were talking about, about preserving national honor kicks in as well. Because yes. once you start fighting this, this war in the Philippines, the idea that you could be pushed out and defeated by people whom you are describing as uncivilized and lesser than you also becomes a kind of untenable yeah. um, possibility, especially since so much of this debate by the time you shift to the Philippines is being framed as America taking its rightful place alongside other major world powers by claiming a stake in, in Asia. And the other point I wanted to make was that I think that when you look back at this period, it, it has this, this um, uh, veneer of a kind of coherent set of decision-making steps. But it, when I look at it, and Jason, I'd be curious to to know your point on this, it seems as if a lot of these decisions are being made independently and they have a kind of ad hoc nature. So you have mm. the decision to go to war, then you have the decision to um, uh, take Hawaii, uh, then you have this, as you're pointing out, this kind of almost you know spontaneous decision to, to really you know stand firm in, in the Philippines. And a lot of this, I mean, it ends up being coherent after a certain point, but these seem like independent decisions, that they're not actually part of a sort of grand strategic vision that McKinley has about how to expand American influence in the world. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right, that McKinley, um, right, he is going into the war. McKinley is not an imperialist, but by the war's end, McKinley emerges as the first imperialist American president. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it fair? Is it fair to say this is a this is a great point that you've raised? Is this is it fair to say that, that McKinley? I don't want to overdo this, but McKinley kind of I don't want to say stumbled into this, but because he made these decisions without a kind of as you put it, Jennifer, a coherent sort of uh, overarching uh, idea of America's role in the world. It's Roosevelt who then follows, mm -hmm. who seems to really take advantage of that and and spin that into somehow an idea of America's role in the world that is um, much more uh, coherently imperialistic in a certain sense. And so it's almost as though Roosevelt kind of inherits, uh, that's not the right word either, why am I struggling for words? Um, well, I think well, that I think that Roosevelt, especially the Roosevelt corollary, sort of gives a, a coherency to all of this in terms of idealize, ideology and purpose. And so if you think about you know, the kind of shorthand way to think about this period is, is the moment we start turning the Caribbean into an American lake. And I think that it's really Roosevelt, the Roosevelt corollary, and also through his pushing for the Panama Canal, that really has a much more coherent view that all this is going to come together. I mean, if you're a Pacific power, you need the Panama Canal, you need a big Navy, you need 
Yep. Um, you need to have police powers in the Caribbean to put some muscle behind the Monroe Doctrine. You know, I think Roosevelt does have a more coherent vision of this new role for America in the world than McKinley, who I've always seen as this sort of through a series of incremental decision ends up there, but it's not necessarily where he intended to go at the beginning. When you think that he was really trying quite hard to keep America from fighting Spain. I mean, he really worked hard at that. Yeah. No, oh, that's great. That's well put. Yeah. And, and then again, Ro Roosevelt, much more consistently than McKinley does in his justification or ex explanation of America's interventions, both in, uh, well, primarily in um, uh, um, the Western Hemisphere. He then combines those two things that, um, as Jason pointed out earlier, McKinley finally came to <laughs> uh, um, articulate in his war message, his message to Congress on war. What Roosevelt seems to me to consistently do is combine those two purposes or motives or even ends, you might say, in foreign policy, which is it's a combination of promoting uh, and defending American interests and at the same time um, prom uh, it has a kind of humanitarian cause to it. That is, we're promoting um, uh, sort of the civilization of of the world, um, and they're and thereby doing good to certain peoples who are, shall we say, uh, how they would probably would have put it, sort of uh, uncivilized, perhaps even savage, as you mentioned earlier, Jennifer, right? So, so they found a way ultimately, and I think Roosevelt did this probably uh, intentionally and very well to both to bring a lot of people on board in a certain way by saying we're doing we are um, intervening abroad um, for for the combination of the two things it's a it's a it's a it, there's the sense of American honor and interest on the one hand but we are simultaneously doing this in a kind of um, like a like a benefactor and and by the way what that means all, often as you as you know is that sometimes we actually have to go in and fight and, and perhaps govern um, these uh, underdeveloped peoples uh, around the world for their own good which I think is one of the larger arguments or one of the main arguments that came out with regard to the Philippines, right? If, if we're cut off from governing Cuba by the Teller Amendment, but we're not <clears throat> restricted by Congress from governing ultimately in the Philippines, how do you justify, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the fact that we are going to do so um, with, with pretty strong opposition from the inhabitants of the Philippines? Um, how do we justify that? I mean, the Filipinos, again, I use that term because it does come to be commonly accepted after a while. But when the Filipinos start to fight back, they actually issue their own declaration of independence and and make some of the same arguments that Americans had made, which was they had a right to govern themselves by their own consent. How do we justify the fact that we actually wage a war against the Filipinos over the over whether we ought to rule them or they ought to rule themselves? Well, it seems to me the more powerful in a certain way and appealing answer to a lot of people was they're not ready to govern themselves yet and we therefore it would be better for them to be governed by us a more advanced um and and, and civilized people so they can learn sort of the lessons of, of what it means to be a civilized people and therefore more capable of governing themselves i'm doing too much talking i apologize but no that was all that was all really really good and i think uh, exactly right tr really i mean tr fully embraces the um um the doctrine of imperialism the idea of progressive imperialism that we get involved around the world both for the honor and interest of america but also for the sake of uplifting other foreign oppressed peoples mckinley whereas instead of sort of you know, giving that idea, the idea of imperialism, a bear hug, uh, McKinley really has to be pushed into that. Um, and I think part of that is because McKinley is dealing with a much more divided um, Republican Party. Um, because going into the, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish American War, the Republican Party is divided. On the one hand, you have the, the pro imperialists, um, like Albert J. Beveridge, Senator from Indiana, and one of his speeches was among the documents we read. Uh, for today's session uh, that speaks to many of the same themes you brought out just now, Chris, and I think, I, I hope we can get to that. Um, but then you also have others like, uh, what was his name, Thomas Reed, the uh, the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, very anti-imperialistic Republican. And McKinley is having to to deal with 
these divisions in the Republican Party that by Roosevelt's era are pretty much settled in the direction of imperialism. Yeah. yeah. And I would just add to that, I think that when we started uh, this conversation, or at least a few, uh, maybe about 10 minutes ago, we were making the point of the distinction between how Cuba was being treated and the Philippines. But in 1901, with the Platt Amendment, there's actually more cohesion now, because even this, this promise of independence to Cuba is somewhat reneged upon with the Platt Amendment, where Cuba really becomes another one of these islands that has to be under the tutelage of the United States. We get the rights to Guantanamo Bay, if we want to talk about a turning point, something, mm -hmm. <laughs> something we still have. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea that they have to consult with us before they can have uh, international agreements and that we have the right to keep our military there to protect life, liberty, and property. So mm -hmm. it's really a protectorate status. And so even even that then becomes a much more coherent foreign policy vision of how we're going to deal with these, um, these uh, what are, I don't even know what to call them. They're not, they're sort of colonized, sort of not colonized, but yeah. these new possessions that are coming under American control. That's a, and Jennifer, that's a great point because that's also part of the debate, right? When you yeah. call these, what, what, what is the future condition of these territories or that's protectorates right, yeah. or, mm -hmm. uh, or possessions? Are they possessions? Are they protectorates? And I know that argument plays out in the, in, in the Philippines as well. The, in Cuba, the, the, because Congress had issued the Teller Amendment, it was pretty much clear that officially we were not going to permanently govern or even make Cuba part of American territory, right? So the, mm -hmm. even though, as you point out, with the Platt Amendment and other future things, we kind of found ways around that. And the, 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 to me, the Platt Amendment essentially says, yeah, we we sort of, you know, yeah, we know we can't permanently govern Cuba, but it also implies that we can govern them anytime and for as long as we need to, mm -hmm. both for our good, but especially for their good, right? right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and fine. in the Philippines, right. in the Philippines, those islands will become incorporated territories or dependents on the United States. Although nobody believes seriously that the Philippines will ever eventually be annexed as a state, as yeah. that they will come into the union as a, as a new state. Um, yeah, that's part and, of the debates too, right? And, and what, yeah, what you call Senate. this? I mean, this was a, a huge debate even among the the imperialists. And T.R. Right, he hated that word, imperialist. He says, "I'm not an imperialist. I'm an expansionist. I'm an expansionist." Um, McKinley hated the term imperialist. He says, "No, I'm not in favor of imperialism. This is manifest destiny." <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and you oh. think about we even have trouble now. What do we call? The conflict in the Philippines? Do we call it an insurrection, which implies that this is an unlawful um, resistance of American control? Do we call it a war so that we, we recognize the Philippines as a kind of having sovereignty and so they have a right to wage war? So even the terminology, you know, we're, 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 we're what do I say, hamstrung by what are, are they Filipinos? Is this, is this an insurrection or a war? Are these colonies or protectorates or territories yeah. under our control? I mean, all that language, it's worth considering the complications of this language because just uh, unilaterally embracing one of these terms actually picks a side in this debate because different yeah. sides are using this terminology to assert a certain uh, reality of the situation. No, that's that's really well put. And and again, this is <laughs> this is made even more interesting by the fact that the, you know the question came up what to do about Guam and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And there, to, there, there was much less debate about whether or not we should, what we should do with them, and and it was it was a relatively easy path to making them territories. Um, in Guam, the main justification was we can make them a territory because Guam was much more strategically vital in terms of its location for U.S. military and commercial interests in the Pacific. Um, and then the argument was made in the debates over uh, Puerto Rico that we could we could constitutionally, according to the Constitution, add them as a territory only if we only if we had the intent of eventually admitting them as a state and thereby making them the, the, the inhabitants of Puerto Rico full citizens of the United States. And um, I don't know whether anybody really had that intent, but it seemed like that argument was much easier to make in Puerto Rico. Um, 
than it was in the Philippines. And as Jason was pointing out, um, there were people making that argument that you know we can we can um, we can govern the, the Filipinos as a as a territory. And others objected in in the Senate, saying, "You're telling me you have you intend to make." Uh, at some point in the future, the Filipinos part of, of the United States, a full member of the, of the Union. So that complicated the debates as well. And um, but it's, I always find it interesting that it was a relatively easy decision with regard to certainly uh, Puerto Rico and, and also Guam. Um, well, well, you uh, you said that very euphemistically, but I guess I would just want to point out that there's oh. There's racism all around. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That, <laughs> <I> was... that, <laughs> that no side has the corner on the racial argument. Right. <laughs> right. There's there's racist arguments on both sides. The racist argument that these people do not have the mental capacity. I think in one of the documents, it sort of says, you know, they're children, so yes. we have to treat them like children, and they are. Uh, they don't have the innate capacity for self-governing the same way that Anglo-Saxons do. But in what you're saying, you know, there were some anti-imperialists who said, what, you know, more people of color um, as citizens? Absolutely not. So, right. you know, there were there were not always such high minded reasons for people even opposing um, uh, taking the Philippines as a colony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and for those reasons that you just brought out there, Jennifer, I mean that that's the that's the compelling force behind um, what McKinley and TR envision in regards to America's role in the Philippines, because they are like children in terms of their innate capacities. That is, that they they don't have sort of the developed capacity for for self government, for self rule. That's why. Right, we, the enlightened and powerful United States, need to go in and teach them self-government, uh, to teach these these children um, how to how to govern themselves, and so that's what we that that's our moral obligation in the uh, in the Philippines um, because they're incapable of ruling themselves. We now need to go in there and rule them absolutely. We're not going to get their consent. We're going to rule them absolutely because they're children. Uh, but with the hopes of elevating them or uh, uplifting them to uh, to a condition to circumstances where self-government might be possible sometime in the future, sometime down the line, uh, through the path of this people's moral, intellectual, and spiritual development that will be spearheaded by the benevolence of the United States. Yeah, that's very well. And my, I'm glad you I'm glad you're both addressing this because this was. Uh, the focus of several questions. Uh, Carolina submitted a question on the on the sort of the, the racism um, as a motive to to imp the imperialist desire, and I'm 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 glad I'm especially glad Jennifer you brought up that um, that that racism played a part for both uh, some pro imperialists and anti imperialists, right? That the 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 Jason just articulated the that 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 part of the imperialist mind. Um, that made the argument that because these, um, uh, you know, they were often brutal, as you know, in their language, right? So I'm just Im imitating their language. That, that because these people are so savage and uncivilized and barbarous, that that we have a, mor a moral obligation to help them become civilized, right? But on the other hand, as Jennifer pointed out too, uh, you have that part of the anti-imperialist uh, mind that says. Uh, yeah, of course they're savages, but but uh, but you know why do we you know why would we therefore want to to govern them or ha or you know occupy them or have anything to do with them, right? So this idea of um, of the degree of civilization or the extent sort of the the, um, uh, the the point to which a people has evolved in terms of their their civilization and their capacities for for self government uh, it plays an important role on both sides, as you point out and. Mm -hmm. Um, Larry just submitted a question. Would the racism, the racist ideology, therefore have ranked Puerto Ricans and Cubans above, say, Asian Filipinos and therefore made Puerto Rico a, as a territory more palatable? It's, it, that is such an interesting question. Um, one of the things I, I have done some work looking at political uh, cartoons of this, of this period. And if you look at uh, political cartoons and, and, um, caricatures of the Cubans po pre main sinking, they are depicted as basically very light skinned, um, very uh, well educated sort of refined people. 
the minute that the war is over and you start looking at political cartoons, you start seeing even Cubans being depicted as black babies. That, that now we have to actually uplift them. And it's wow. this really interesting shift of Cubans from white to black almost overnight, wow. depending on whether, you know, because the humanitarian campaign has to really appeal to people that, that, the, that you know, we need to help them. And that, that focuses on Cubans as light-skinned, and then when it becomes to they need our tutelage, they're, they're depicted completely differently in political caricature. And that is a quite striking shift that you can see around the debate. I think that one of the interesting things to me in the documents we had here was that, you know, given our situation today where we think of race, we think very much of black and white, but in these documents, they're really concerned about Caucasian and Asian and uh, Anglo-Saxon and Asian. So there's right. there's race, racial aspects, but also race in the terminology of the time as, as being connected to ethnicity. And it's, it's worth recalling for us that this is the moment of probably the height of our anti-Asian sentiment in the U.S. We've had the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, but now we're going to see in the you know few years after the Spanish-American War, the Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan, that the, the height of anti-Asian feeling is really at, it's really occurring during this period. And that's coming out in this debate as well, that it's the, it's the Asian sort of ye yellow peril that we have to be concerned mm -hmm. about domestically. And that's where I think the, the anti-imperialists are concerned about what is this gonna mean for us as a country? It might help us economically, although there's a lot of people arguing that colonies are expensive and to claim that we are going to sell a lot of manufactured goods to underdeveloped nations does, is not actually a logical argument. But then there's also these concerns as to what happens to these people in the future. Do they right. start getting rights? Do they start getting, can they start um, sending representatives to the U.S.? Can they, do they even if they're not full-fledged citizens, what protections are we going to be giving them? And that's that's where you start seeing a lot of this this racial ideology coming to the forefront. Jennifer, that's, that's so wonderful. interesting. No, that's fascinating. And can I just say, by the way, I I'm always so impressed with your with your work looking at at popular literature and newspaper, uh, uh, you know, cartoons. And I, I just I'm just going to mention quickly one of the most interesting presentations I've seen here as um, as a mag uh, as part of the mag course was your talk last year on the. Um, on the use of uh, propaganda to to to, uh, to to recruit for the for the war effort in World War One, I. I thought that was fantastic, but I, I had no idea that that was that that shift was actually taking place simultaneously. It just reinforces the the depth to which uh, you know racial distinctions were an important consideration in the minds of of, of, of white Americans at the time. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would only add to that, and I mean, that, I, I think that's exactly right, and it makes a lot of sense. I did not know that about the political cartoons and the depictions in America of Cubans pre and post Spanish American War. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and it, it, you sort of would expect that um, knowing some of the history, because I mean, for for the for the progressive imperialist, and even for for some of the, the many of the anti imperialists as well. Um, right. This was this was imperialism was a racial theory. It was based on racial ideology, and it wasn't just sort of a well. There's you know whites, there's us, and then there's the rest of the world, and all the other races of the world just just thrown together in one big one big batch. Um, for the progressive imperialists, there's there's a racial hierarchy yeah. to understanding the world, to understanding the racial identity of human beings. And there are some races who are more superior, others more inferior, and they sort of fall along this ladder, uh, depending upon what we, the enlightened United States, think about them and what their place ought to be. Uh, and so in regards to you know, Puerto Rico, yeah, maybe that's a race that's further along the evolutionary ladder and the, the Filipinos, although they didn't call them Filipinos, they had more racist names for them, um, are further back on the, the chain of, of human development and therefore require um, a greater degree of intervention by the the United States and other more civilized nations like her. Yeah. Jason, what do you think um, about the fact that a lot of the Filipinos, especially in Luzon, have been converted to Catholicism? Do you think that this is also something that, because on the one hand, yeah, you could think that this shows that they actually have 
long exposure to Western civilization, but on the same time, you know, the fact that a lot of this mis these missionaries that are going to the East are obviously Protestants, and so, so the, the Catholicism is also problematic. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question, Jennifer. I'm not quite sure I have a, a good answer for it. Um, I mean, I do know that the that Christian missionaries, they sort of will use progressive imperialism in America's role abroad in places like the Philippines as a as a springboard for um, bringing the gospel um, to other foreign peoples. Um, but why the, the Filipinos end up uh, sort of rejecting the, the, the Protestantism of Christian minis, uh, missionaries uh, in favor of Catholicism, I mean, that sort of speaks to me of uh, the role the Spanish had played up until the time that, um, mm -hmm. that America gets involved, that those uh, Catholic roots uh, went a lot deeper than the uh, than the Christian missionaries uh, believed, and as they found out when they got there, when the missionaries got there, that they weren't dealing with sort of these um, completely uh, the, these complete barbarians who were void of under any understanding of Christian spirituality whatsoever, right? Because of the role that Spain had played and the role that the Catholic Church, by extension, then had played uh, among those among those people. Um, the Christian Jason, missionaries, I think, were a little disappointed in that. <laughs> Jason, that reminds me. That was really well put. But it reminds me. It's it's like it's almost a similar argument to some of the arguments made at the time of the American Revolution with regard to the French in Quebec, right? In in in, in French Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a question as to whether we could uh, we should appeal to them to join the <clears throat> the cause of revolution and independence. And of course, we know they did appeal to them, but uh, but uh, there were a lot of suspicions on the part of um, uh, American uh, revolutionaries, especially in New England, that that somehow the, the the Catholicism of French Canada had somehow corrupted it and made it made it much more disposed made the people of uh, of Quebec much more disposed toward being slavish and uh, and therefore um, uh, reduced to the level of needing a kind of despotism. In a way, right? It's not exactly the same yeah. argument, but I, I do no, think. No, I, I think it actually is because you know I'm just taking a look here at Beveridge because he's he's talking about the way that the Filipinos have almost been corrupted by Spain that they yeah. have, and I think that's that that makes a lot. What you said just makes a lot of sense to me in terms of this that they've been misruled and they've they've been set on the wrong path to be self-governing because of this Spanish, you know, he's called it kind of weak, corrupt, cruel, and capricious rule. But the, the element of Catholicism is in there as well. And I think yeah. that that idea you just said that Catholicism teaches you to be a, to be a, a, a slave to the Pope or, you know, to be unthinking. So you're not able to really be self-governing. Well, we know that that's an element of American society at this time as well. And that also speaks to the idea that even though they've been exposed to European institutions, this has not civilized them in the way that America believes they should be civilized. Right. Yeah, and I would add, Jennifer, if you don't mind, that, yeah. that in the Philippines, it was exactly <laughs> the opposite. It was that it was the existence of Catholicism in conjunction with Spanish government and Spanish yeah. rule that was used um, intentionally and consciously to keep the Filipinos at a level of, of simply uh, accepting uh, to tyranny and subjugation and we know that by the way the spanish were really brutal <laughs> yes <laughs> in their rule i mean they became more and more brutal in, in cuba as we know uh as the cubans started uh you know engaging in re rebellions there were rebellions i think in the 1860s and 70s right in cuba mm -hmm. um and but the but uh but in the philippines uh, the spanish just was really brutal from my understanding and reading of this they were ruthless in their in the treatment of the people of the Philippines, and they used apparently intentionally Catholicism and the authority of the church in conjunction in conjunction with the political authority of Spain to really um, brutally subjugate these people. And and that that is the argument of as you point out, Beveridge and others when they say, or that's part of their argument when they say, the people of the Filipino, as opposed to the people of Cuba, right. A lot of them argued, at least be, before and during this, the, the war, but they would argue, unlike the people of Cuba, the people of the Philippines have had absolutely no practice 
in the art of self-government. In fact, just the opposite. They have been mm -hmm. subjugated for centuries to the exact, to nothing but tyranny and despotism. And to say that, that now that we've, you know, remove the Spanish from from the Filipinos to say that we should simply um, assume that the people of the Philippines are going to miraculously now assume the habits of self-government and practice them wisely is insane. Well, McKinley always believed that. McKinley, that was he he called that his firm, unshaken belief that if America does her work well in the Philippines, eventually, sometime soon the Filipinos will be capable of assuming the blessings of liberty and self-government for themselves. Yeah. McKinley dies still with that as his firm, unshaken belief. Now, TR, when he comes in, he sort of shares McKinley's optimism. But as time goes on, as time drags by in the Philippines, and um, we see America having to take on a much more oppressive role, especially in regards to the um, the Filipino insurrectionists who were rebelling against American rule as they had been rebelling against Spanish rule. Uh, TR, as time goes by, becomes a lot less confident. One, is this even going to happen soon? Probably not. Maybe long term. But TR seems to, to finally settle on the idea that, you know what? They might never be ready for self government Yeah, yeah that's well, a great... Well, also, Sorry. I was just going to say that you know, the viciousness of the war also begins to really shock a lot of Americans. I mean, you have a lot of publicity given around, you know, their version of waterboarding, the water cure, and oh, yeah. the idea that you also have African-American soldiers fighting in the Philippines, and there's open discussion in the U.S. about the seeming contradiction here that um, they're fighting to expand American empire, yet um, not able to live as full-fledged American citizens at home. And so I think that a lot of the inherent ideological and also the just the sheer um, shocking nature of the way that the war is being conducted, which gets a lot of exposure in a yellow press, uh, mm -hmm. similar the way that Spanish atrocities had, there are a lot of charges of hypocrisy that here we claimed that we were going to come in and be a different kind of power. And then, you know, there there is the... I always look at the Philippines and think um, about Vietnam because I feel like there have become a lot of similar contradictions in the Philippines. You, you definitely have efforts to create schools, build roads, I mean, bring improvements yeah. to, the, to the lives of people to kind of win hearts and minds. But then on the flip side of it is you have some really vicious um, atrocities that are committed and it's almost this same kind of inherent contradiction that America will will face further on in the century when it undertakes almost a similar kind of endeavor. The, the language is a little bit different, but it's not as different as as we might as we might imagine. And that that's right. going to just prove to be and and it will be equally divisive within the country as these things become known. Oh, that's yeah, a that's a great point, great Jennifer. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, in terms of modern American foreign policy or more recent American foreign policy, certainly the the racial aspect has dropped away from the way we we talk about America's role in the world, um, and yet the emphasis is still there on providing humanitarian aid to other foreign oppressed peoples, and so today Americans, I think. Um, as a result of the, the past 100 years history of foreign policy, starting here with the Spanish-American War and the events in Havana Harbor, the sinking of the Maine, Americans remain sort of really confused about what, why does America enter world conflicts abroad? Is it for the sake of preserving our own rights and interests? Is it for the sake of helping others or some sort of amalgamation, combination of the two, which McKinley was the first one to do? Mm -hmm. um, as, as a result, I think, it, I think it leads to a lot of confusion that's, that's that remains to this day. Yeah. What is a just and proper American foreign policy? What does it look Absolutely. like? Absolutely. And yeah, I, I, I would just add one other, because when since the whole um, theme is turning points and um, significant moments, I, I also, I do think, however, this is a significant moment for the U.S. because there is in the ideas of the imperialists, and Mark Twain actually mentions this as well in a derisive way, that the way to move forward is to sort of play Europe's game, to really yeah. develop a formal colonial empire. 
And this is really the only moment that America will do this. We will certainly have plenty of influence, but we will use it after this in it as an informal empire as opposed to a formal empire. And I think that this is a moment, another important moment of decision in the U.S., where the fact that this has been so divisive within the country and there's been so much debate and there's so much uncertainty about this as America's path, that in the end, what really triumphs is this faith in American exceptionalism and that we are not, yes, we want to be on par with ever their powers in terms of respect, but we don't, we decide not in a sense to create the same kind of formal empires that Britain and France do. I mean, this is the moment where Britain and France are really expanding their empires big time. You know, Africa's being divided. Um, the, uh, they're, they're going uh, much more seriously into Asia. And the U.S. from this point on will will not use creating formal colonies as the path for increased world influence. So I think it's also a, a, a different turning point in another direction, which is away from following the European model. That's that's a great point. And uh, by the way, just uh, these are really really thoughtful um, contributions <laughs> from both of you. And in the process of discussing this, I just wanted to note that I think we've addressed several of the questions. <laughs> uh, that, that had been submitted, uh, perhaps, I hope we've answered Brian's question about why we seem to be so willing to help the Cuban people and, and yet we treated the, the, the Filipino people differently. Um, I think I think uh, a lot has come out on that. Uh, I think we've clarified the the purpose of the Platt Amendment. Um, and oh, by the way, can I just add one more thing? There's one other thought that occurred to me in light of things that both of you brought up that I hadn't thought of before. And on that question of, of why we treated the how we thought of the Filipinos and the Cubans differently. Um, uh, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned earlier how how portrayals of the Cubans changed, uh, uh, you know, from the beginning of the war to the end. And it just reminded me again of of one of the arguments going into the war was that the the, the, the Cuban people, not the Spanish occupiers, but the but the Cuban people, somehow were capable of exercising a degree of self-government. And they use the language of them being more civilized, right, than, than a lot of the others around the world who are part of Spanish territories. And and a few Americans even suggested that that, that was partly due to their proximity to, you know, the, the United States, right, that they had attained a certain level of, of civilization uh, through commercial engagements with the United States and, and so on and so forth. But it reminds me, too, as you point out, that by the end of the war or after the war, that port, the, the way we thought about the Cubans changed. And as we know, um, the, the Platt Amendment, again, uh, the, and just so everybody knows the Platt, what the Platt Amendment was, it was an amendment tacked on, I believe, to, to US Senate approval of the Cuban Constitution, which had been written and ratified by the Cuban people. Uh, the, the, the United States Senate decided it had it had the authority to ratify or reject that constitution and they ratified or accepted it i should say uh approved it with the with the condition of the platt amendment which said the united states reserves the right to intervene in cuba uh whenever our interests or their interests uh needed to be protected and the cubans were incapable of of, of governing themselves well and i'm what that reminds me of then is roosevelt had to intervene on several occasions in Cuba. And I, if you, now that I think about it, and I go back and I read Roosevelt's justifications for those interventions. Even Roosevelt describes, starts describing the Cubans as less civilized. And, and he uses lines to describe them like they're a fiery and uh, temperamental people. Um, he doesn't quite call them uncivilized, but he, he portrays them in a way that would paint them much less civilized than that sort of mm -hmm. typical European understanding of those things. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to mention that because I, I, I'm grateful that you have pointed out that distinction and helped me make a connection I hadn't made before. On the question of the war, par the parallels that you're, that you're both raising with future wars, um, I, I think that those are wonderful uh, connections, including Vietnam, Jennifer, as you bring up, um, not only in terms of the hypocrisy and the atrocities, uh, right? Um, um, by the way, um, you know, going into one of the reasons that the Cuban intervention was justified on humanitarian grounds was because of the uh, the treatment under what was the general's name? Wayland. Wayland. Does anybody know how to pronounce Whaler. it? Whaler. Whaler. 
I think it's Whalen is how it's pronounced and his reconcentration uh, camps and, 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 and then it, as you mentioned, we did the same thing in the Filipinos, exactly the same thing. Um, but, but the, but the real parallel as you, as you both point out nicely is, um, not just between the, the Spanish American war or the, the treatment of the Philippines and Vietnam, but other conflicts and wars is this distinction between what our goal is. What is our goal? Is our goal to conquer or is it to help and benefit them to civilize them? That, that seems to be where we've been divided. And, and that's a big debate in the, in the, in the Vietnam war among, especially among Johnson's administration. I know uh, there's, deep disagreement over what our purpose there is. Is it to is it to defeat the communists and drive the communists out of Vietnam or is it to help civilize and improve the quality of life for the people of Vietnam? Um, so I just I just wanted to reinforce that distinction that you're that you're both making so nicely. And I'll stop talking so much here because there was um, since we were sort of ended there on the theme of imperialism, there have been several questions uh, uh, on the, um, again, sort of the larger American views of imperialism. Uh, Nick posted at the very beginning of our discussion, he's been waiting patiently for his answer, um, a question about sort of the views of American businessmen uh, uh, on, uh, with regard to imperialism. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm wondering if either of you can say something to um, who tended to be in favor of imperialism um, before and after the Spanish-American War, and I'll also add to that, uh, kind of combining some questions here, what role did um, the yellow journalism, what role did Hearst and Pulitzer play in, in not just promoting um, the cause of imperialism before the Spanish-American War, but perhaps after? Yeah, those are some really good questions. I can at least really try to answer Sorry. one of them, <laughs> one of them in part, because um, I'm thinking of the, the last document um, that we haven't mentioned yet, I don't think, the, the platform of the American Anti-Imperialist League. Um, the anti-imperialists, those who, who come out and oppose uh, McKinley and then later TR's doctrine of imperialism in the Philippines and elsewhere, it's really a strange collection of political bedfellows that makes up the, the American anti-imperialists. Because on the one hand, you have sort of your diehard progressives like Jane Addams and John Dewey, who you know you may think would be behind this idea of uplifting other less fortunate uh, human beings throughout the world in America getting involved for the sake of the the regeneration of the world, the civilization of the world, advancing civilization. Um, but Jane Adams and John Dewey they they are sort of repulsed by this idea. Um, and then really for the first time you have as their political allies. Um, others who would disagree with them on, on any other domestic policy. So um, many uh, Republicans like, like Thomas Reed in the House, those who were sort of repulsed by uh, the turn of the Republican Party towards uh, imperialist ends, uh, those who still considered themselves sort of old Lincolnian uh, Republicans, so the, the platform th for the American Anti-Imperialist League, they, they, they quote Lincoln at length, uh, Lincoln's line about that, quote, no man is good enough to govern another man without that latter's consent. When the white man governs himself, that is self-government, but when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government, that is despotism. Um, other references to the Declaration, the Constitution, and, and Washington uh, adorn that anti-imperialist platform. So you've got progressives, you've got old line Republicans, you've got you've got Democrats who are all members of this this anti-imperialist league, uh, who sort of find themselves on this one issue in regards to America's role in the world, sort of thrust together and joining forces in a way that Mark Twain among them as well. Mark Twain right. is another one. Um, who, uh, who Jennifer mentioned, um, right? They, they find themselves sort of united, strangely enough, uh, in opposition to, uh, to imperialism. Yeah, that's a great point. But by the way, Jason, I thought of this earlier um, and, and meant to ask, but since you kind of bring it back up, and I know, again, you wrote about this in your dissertation. So what, what, what was it about the Republic? People are often surprised to find that it's the Republicans who are, there are more Republicans who are, who are imperialist have imperialist tendencies than Democrats? Can you explain mm -hmm. why you think that is um, in, in you know in a few minutes? <laughs> yeah, no, a really really good question. No, it, it really is 
uh, the Republicans are the the ones who um, get America rolling down this path of of imperialism in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's your Republicans who are the first real uh, progressives at its earliest time in American history. Um, and I would maybe go back to just elaborate a bit on talking about the split in the Republican Party that happens as a result of McKinley's decision to go to war and the reasons he gives for it. Um, because both sides, the split that occurs in the Republican Party, you know, in favor, pro and anti-imperialism, both sides think that they are following in the path, following in the footsteps of the American Declaration of Independence, that they are following in the paths of that great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln. Um, so, for example, the, the pro-imperialists say, look, you know, Lincoln freed millions of slaves. We're now going to, you know, outdo Lincoln. We're going to um, out Lincoln Lincoln by freeing even tens of millions of more people, enslaved people throughout the world. And you see Beveridge, the Republican senator from Indiana, talking about the Declaration of Independence. And, well, the Declaration only applies to self-governing human beings. And so the, the Filipinos and others like them, they're not covered by the principles of the, the Declaration of Independence. And then on the other side, the, the anti-imperialists, um, they, they too go back to, to the founders in Lincoln and say, hey, hold on a second here. The Declaration says... Right, that the that just government derives its powers from the consent of the governed. We are not getting the consent of the Filipinos before America comes in and and, and governs them absolutely. Now the 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 pro imperialists will say, well, it's different because we're governing them for their own good. Spanish imperialism had never looked out for the good of the peoples, the specific peoples involved, and so they'll make that distinction. But as Beveridge says, right, if the Declaration applies to these Filipinos, then the declaration would be wrong. Right, right. And could I just uh, interject here that it's a document we don't have in the packet, but there's an interesting speech that Henry Cabot Lodge gives in the oh. Senate where he sort of points out, I, I kind of like his honesty here. He says, well, yeah, we say consent of the governed, but let's, let's look back at the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, there were no blacks that were consented. No, women weren't, weren't, didn't consent. Um, not all white men at the time of the revolution could right. vote. So in fact, there are a lot of people who don't consent. If by consent, we mean vote in favor of, of a government and that right. in a sense, the best people need to be the people making these decisions. And doesn't, and Jennifer, does it lodge, if I remember the, if I'm thinking of the same piece, doesn't he mention, <clears throat> excuse me, Native Americans and. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Right. So it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like in this fantastical, what do you mean? Do you mean we should be doing right. this too? Right. And so even then there's a kind of um, willingness to, um, to, to look at that, that language, consent of the government, governed as racialized and gender specific language, that yeah. it does not mean mm -hmm. everybody and, and, it's, and that we should understand it that way. Yeah. And the imperialists weren't the first ones to to argue like that. They weren't the mm -hmm. first ones to interpret the Declaration of the Constitution in that way. I mean, you can go back to the 1820s and the 1830s yeah. and John C. Calhoun in the defense that he gives for American slavery as a positive good. His understanding of liberty is exactly the same that we get from these later uh, progressive imperialists at the end of the century. No, that's a great point. So and in who, some ways, the anti-imperialists are, are not just then arguing for the <coughs> status quo okay, let's not have colonies. They're actually at, are advocating for a new interpretation of what consent of the governed means, that that's a kind of new, ra you know, it's a new conception of even understanding that term. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. That's a wonderful point. And, it, um, and part of the reason I asked this question, it leads me back to my original motive for asking the question, which is <clears throat> that prior to the Civil War, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you think about people who were supportive of Manifest Destiny, there were so there were so many of them among the Democratic Party. It didn't seem to me that it was Douglas. simply a party distinction, right? Um, uh, you know, Calhoun and others were uh, the Democrats were great supporters of Manifest Destiny, and I just again I wondered the extent to which the insofar as Manifest Manifest Destiny could carry over into the idea of expansionism and imperialism, I, I wondered how the outcome of the Civil War. Uh, might have affected, uh, uh, you know, with the realignment of the parties and the creation yeah. of a new party. That's, yeah, that's a really good 
point, Chris. I would just say very quickly, um, yeah, you have Manifest Destiny back in the 1840s and 50s, um, and then McKinley thinks he's advocating a form of Manifest Destiny here in the 1890s, but there are really two different kinds of Manifest Destiny that's going on. The one of the pre-Civil War period is we're going to expand in order to take in more people and make them slaves. And expand slavery. Here, right? And expand slavery. After the Civil War and McKinley's Manifest Destiny, his version is, no, we're going to uplift these people. We're doing this for their good, not for our own good by, by subjugating them and making them our slaves. Or at least for their ultimate liberation after perhaps a necessary period of subjugation by benevolent right <laughs> uh, 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 administrators so to speak right under yes. the authority of the united states government but i see that that's a great point the, the goal shifts from expansion of slavery to the expansion of, of liberty that's a, yeah that's and that goes back to one of the points that jennifer brought out at the beginning right the the terms that we use to describe these different modes of thought or action really matter because right you see manifest destiny is being used as if it's a continuation of the old form of manifest destiny when really there's a very discernible difference between the manifest destiny pre-civil war and then post-civil war yeah it's a great in terms point. of its ultimate aims and objects yeah nice point i was going to mention to, I'm, jennifer i'm glad you brought up henry cabot lodge if others are if, if people joining us are interested in reading other uh, views on these things i i do recommend reading lodge if you can get your hands on some of the senate debates over over what to do with these former Spanish uh, possessions. Uh, Lodge is an interesting fellow because um, on the on the Philippines, he makes the kinds of arguments you were pointing out, Jennifer, um, um, uh, very nicely. Uh, but then when it comes to, you can read Cab Henry Cabot Lodge's arguments about what to do with Guam and Puerto Rico, and, and it's just a matter of American self-interest. He's brutally honest uh, uh, in the Senate when it comes to, uh, there's he doesn't mix in much of this talk of, of um, of applying the deck or expanding the, the, the declaration of independence and, and these things to these people it's just sort of a brutal calculation of american self-interest um, in, in those particular territories um we have about three minutes two minutes left three minutes left so i hesitate to throw this question out but this is a great question from stan maybe this is a good one to end on uh stan wants to know whether you believe that this moment in american history marks the beginning of america's role as global cop uh, to protect the liberties of people everywhere. Oh, well, you have two I'll, minutes. I'll I'll do I'll go for one minute here. Yeah. I do think that if you you do see this this shifting language, and I noted this, you know, if you think about how America has always defined itself as an exceptional nation, and you had the idea of city on a hill, then you move into manifest destiny, and now if we look at Beveridge's language, we start seeing him talking about the regeneration of the world. And I think it's probably not too hard for us to, to skip a few years ahead and see Wilsonialism beginning to take shape and this idea that we have to make the world safe for democracy, that, that there is a progression here and that in some ways this marks a turning point of us looking out in the world and having a set of conflicting uh, motivations for being in the world, which I think has come out in this conversation, we still are grappling with today. So in that sense, I really do see this as opening up a new period in American history in terms of its it, it redefining the role that it will have from this point forward in the in the larger world. Yeah, I'm, I'm yes. glad you, I'm glad you did that, Jennifer, because I was hoping at some point you would at least be able to make a connection between uh, you know the Spanish American War and how that affected, especially World War One. Uh, uh, I am a master at connecting everything to World War One. <laughs> Just any events, I, I it doesn't it. matter. It doesn't matter it. what it is. I can connect it to World War One. <laughs> <laughs> I believe. I believe it. Yeah. I've seen you do it on several occasions. Yes. So that's a great point. By the way, I just mentioned Jennifer in our webinar series. We're skipping to uh, World War II. We're skipping World War One. Otherwise, we would certainly have to <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. I can blame Jeremy for that. We're gonna one. have to talk about that. <laughs> Throwing Jeremy under the bus. <laughs> uh, Jason, anything to add to that, or thoughts? Or I know you've written a lot about this mm -hmm. as well and thought about it as well. No, so. I I think that was that was really well said by 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 Jennifer there. The only the only thing I would maybe clarify a bit is I see maybe less of a progression from the American founding up through the Spanish-American War and more of a, a clean break where you have one understanding of 
uh, of human nature, of good government, of America's relationship with the world coming out from the American founding that for the most part governs American external affairs um, for most of the 19th century up until right this moment of crisis as we've been calling it and the civil war which which not the civil war excuse me the spanish american war which represents instead of a maybe a progression of the past a a clean break from it and one that uh america uh to this day is still is still under the influences of yeah nicely done now there you go stan you managed at the very end of our webinar to finally bring out a friendly but scholarly disagreement among <laughs> awful people, which is, right. a, which is wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, this, is, I'm, I, this is what keeps us talking about these things when we when we find uh, things like that to, to, to argue over. So I want to thank you both very much for an extraordinarily enlightening conversation. I've enjoyed it very much and have learned a great deal. So um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Real pleasure. Thank you. Great job and, moderating. Oh, well, thanks. Every yeah. once in a while, I, okay, I, you know, <laughs> I get interested in these things. So, uh, and, and thanks for the questions that, um, that folks submitted today. They were great questions. I'll uh, just remind you again once more about the email you'll get with the link for your certificate of participation. Um, I mentioned this earlier, both of these um, fine scholars teach in our Master of Arts program. So if you're not familiar with that, um, maybe take a minute. Uh, just do a Google search for MAHG MAG, and it brings up our, our website to see if maybe there's some courses uh, that you might be interested in. This is how we essentially teach our courses, um, conversationally, in this sense. Our next Saturday webinar will be January 6th, and as I mentioned a minute ago, we'll actually be on the attack on Pearl Harbor, and we'll be joined by John Moser, a colleague here at National University, and David Krugler of the University of wisconsin Platteville. So until then, uh, best wishes, and I hope to see you in January. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.